So my name's Phil Wislowski, and I primarily teach Linux and the LAMP stack and other things like that. But I also do teach some of the graphics stuff. And I've, for the past couple of summers, been trying to introduce summer camp students, sixth to eighth graders, to a variety of open source graphics and video and editing stuff. I'm, I'm so glad to see that KDN Live finally has a Windows version, even if it is a little buggy, because there just really hasn't been a good open source um, video editor for Linux. Uh, sorry, for Windows. There's been one for Linux. And Krita was one of the ones that was brought up a couple of years ago. Unlike things like Photoshop or GIMP or other programs, it's really focused on painting. Um, and I've got a slightly out of date already set of the slides up in a zip file. It's just, I zip the reveal JS directory, open up the index file, turn on JavaScript, and you'll get the same thing. Um, I'm going to, whatever changes I make will be put up at that location here in a little bit. Um, I am not an artist. I tend to do more photo editing, that type of graphic stuff. But I like putting this out here because this is an amazing paint program for those folks who know how to use it. Look at the various tutorials, people who do it. The closest thing I've seen similar to this, though it still has a couple of features that Creed is working on, uh, is an old program called Paint Tool Sci. If you have anybody who used to be a big fan of you know, creating manga uh, or anime type stuff, that was one of the most popularly stolen programs in existence, even though it only costed about 50 bucks. Um, and had some really interesting features. So again, it's a digital painting program. There are definitely some things it can do for creation of items that you can't do in something like GIMP. But some of the basic photo editing stuff is either not there or sometimes a little bit limited, because that's not its focus. Uh, if you're just doing photo editing, you're much better off with GIMP. Um, it focuses very heavily on the painting and drawing features. Um, has a lot of different types of brushes that it comes with. Most of those brushes have a variety of effects. So instead of just having one color go over top of the other, you can actually have them so that as they go over top, they automatically blend the colors between them, like you're doing. And, and there's other programs that do that, of course. Um, and lots of different types of layers. And again, I just kind of want hold to hold out that it's not really a photo editing program. Now, installing Krita. If you decide you want the most recent version, yeah. Well, first off, if you're like me and I like the long-term support versions of KUbuntu or Ubuntu, that's where the problem comes in. So they have a PPA, Personal Package Archive, called Krita Lime, uh, where you can get the most recent version, as long as you're using 16.10 or newer. They don't support 16.04. Going, huh. I'll shoot. I would really like to show folks the more modern version. So somebody said, oh, you're just being a Luddite. Go try Snap. Snap is a breeze. OK, fine. I'll try it. So I, ha I think I may have to install a couple of Snap packages on Kubuntu, but that was fairly easy. And then Snap install Krita. Hey, that seems to work pretty well. Uh, snap refresh Krita. OK, now again, this particular one probably isn't incredibly designed for Snap yet. That's more the late, slightly later versions of Ubuntu. So it takes you a little while to figure out, OK, I've installed it. How the heck do I start it? Because it doesn't seem to put anything in your desktop menu. So I found out, oh, it's user Snap Krita. Actually, or I thought it was Snap in Krita. I think that's actually wrong. Uh, we'll find out in a minute here. Um, and then this is the part I'm still struggling with. Cool, I've got some files I'd like to work with on my USB drive. Well, Snap is kind of got the same idea as Docker in the fact that you're isolated from everything outside of your little home directory. So I'm going, OK, well, fine. I look up Snap interfaces and see what Krita has access to. And it does not have access to removable drives. So of course, I did Snap connect Krita colon removable dash devices. Ran Snap Interfaces again. Cool. Fired up Krita. No go. So I figured I could just put a sim link to media in Home Phil W. 
And no, uh, I had to put a sim link to home uh, media fill w drive name, and now I can actually get to stuff outside of it. Now, if this is supposedly a security thing and it's circumvented by a simple symbolic link, I'm not sure what the point is other than just make life difficult. It, it truly does seem like if you're using something like Krita or some other graphics program, or worse, if they ever do a snap version of Blender or KDN Live, if you can't access removable media, it's, it's worthless. And that's kind of a bit of a pain to work out. So I'm going to shut this down just to, yeah, fine, uh, whatever. So if I remember right, it's actually snap bin creator. Yeah, OK, so I'll have to fix that on the slide. Um, I'm going to eventually make a shortcut to it. I'm just trying to figure out if it's just because Snap is more geared towards slightly later versions of Ubuntu, or if it's just some of the wonderful little features of it. Um, but this is fairly recent, their 3.14 version, and they have made a lot of improvements. Uh, unfortunately, I'll have to move things around so you can see the full, uh, full menu, but it's, it's you know, pretty reasonable. And it, other than that weird little hiccup where it doesn't like removable media, it actually installs pretty easily. It's kind of a little weird. If you want to update it, you need to do snap refresh Krita, um, which to me, I kind of like the fact that there's a central way to update things and having to remember multiple ways to update things tends to me, well, how many people here would think that there's a chance it might not all get updated? <laughs> I mean, that's the problem we had in the past. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to fix that. Okay. And unfortunately, when you reload, you go back to the first slide, but it's not too big a deal here. Um, so snap in Krita. Uh, some of the things I'm going to look at today is just some of the interface, some of the tools, some of the brushes, uh, the pop-up palette, which has to be, I, I call it a HUD because it really seems like one to me. Um, but it's a very handy little tool. A few of the filters, and then some of the funky things you can do with layers. Um, so. Now I'm going to need to move this over a little bit here. So up here in the upper left-hand corner, Come on. Yeah, right click. Um, and they do a lot of this where you have to right click instead of left click. It's not unusual. Um, and this gives you some of the different workspaces that they've got. And have I gone through all of these? Um, no. Um, and actually, why is it not that's showing me the dockers? Why is it not showing me workspaces? Come on. That was working last night. So there may still be some bugs in here, but this should pop down a workspace list. And it has a lot of the classic ones, like if you're going to be doing painting, or if you're going to be doing uh, various touch-up work, or ink drawings, or whatever. Um, again, when it works, great little feature. Yeah. Live demos, they're always so much fun. That's why I should have recorded this beforehand. But, okay, so for whatever reason, that doesn't want to open up, um, which is kind of odd. But such is life. Now, some of the other tools that it's got. It has an amazing number of little dockable areas, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. You could just right-click on it. Uh, some of them you see are already there. Tool options, uh, color sliders, advanced color selector, layers, brush presets, which that's a really dumb one to close in this thing. Brushes and stuff. I love the, the technical term there. Um, and specific color selector. Now you can add more. And like a lot of programs, you can float things around. You can, you know, stick them back. Um, you know, you, you can... 
adjust the edge for allow the tools. So it's, it's very configurable that way. Um, and then up at the top menu here, uh, which I will again, let's just move this over a little bit. You have, of course, okay. Why are none of these suddenly working? Well, let's just do File New. That may be a problem. Some of the features are disabled until that. Ah, there we go. So context sensitive menus, go figure. So you've got workspaces, animation, uh, big paint, big paint two, vector stuff, the default setting, small vectors and so on. And you can of course set it up the way you want to and save your workspace so that you can always have it set up the way and configured that you want to. Um, but apparently before you can do that, you've got to have a drawing surface available. Yeah, no big deal. Then of course you've got gradients, um, patterns that you can use. And the interesting one <coughs> is the brush presets. Do you get the feeling that they're really big on brushes in Creator? Uh, oh, it's a paint program, but I mean, if there is any one thing that there seems to be about a dozen more options than you may ever need, I don't know. Um, like I said, I'm not a, an artist on this, but they have tons of things that you can change, tons of brother, brushes that came with it, um, and there's a whole bunch of properties, and you can easily create your own custom brushes. And of course, there's also tons of places that share brushes out there. And if you want to pay, there's even people who make brushes for these different programs, and Creta is definitely one of them. Um, so yeah, you know, if you don't like something about a brush you're using, um, yeah, you should be able to, you know, take care of it. Um, and then you can choose a particular brush preset, and these are the ones that it comes with. You can break them up via tagging. Um, there's all, there's block, circle, erasers, FX, ink, mix. There's this odd one that uh, shows up on mine because I decided to create a tag for plug because uh, we're going to make a, a plug set up here once we get a little bit further on. Pixel art and so on. So if I click ink, it shows me all the brushes that are presently tagged as ink. And as far as I know, you can tag them multiple times. So you can have a variety of different little groups here. Let's do paint. And, you know, you can just do all and lots of brushes. They even have basically everything's a brush, even erasers. And they've got five different types of default erasers. Um, Now they've got some of the usual blending modes with lots of op options. Are people familiar with blending modes from Photoshop or GIMP or the rest? I will take that as a no. Um, you can have two different layers that are on top of each other and use basically a mathematical formula to combine them. And sometimes it can be very neat effects. My favorite one is I, you basically remove all the color from a layer. Then you draw the outline, fill it with a solid color. And then on that layer, you set overlay, which basically is going to, in the lighter areas, put more color. In the darker areas, make it a little bit darker. And it looks like you've colorized just part of the image. Um, without the overlay, you've just got this pink blob on top of this flower. Uh, or the green blob on the poor kitten that you're turning green for, you know, St. Patrick's Day. Don't actually use dye, okay, folks? Photoshop is much easier, or GIMP, or any of those. Um, so they have the basic blending modes between layers. Um, they have some of the erasers. They have the ability to deal with different levels of transparency. And for every tool, some of the options pop up. Uh, like I've got a basic brush, I don't even know what it's selected right now, opacity, it's fully opaque, you can adjust the size. And one of the things that's kind of handy about any of these, if you hover over it, you could just use the mouse wheel to adjust this. And if you're over the drawing, you can zoom in and out by just using 
the mouse wheel rolling up and down. Uh, again, it's designed to be really handy. And unlike some of the other programs, I'm still learning the keyboard shortcuts. This always has some of my Photoshop students blink, but the keyboard's your friend in Photoshop, GIMP, or whatever. Um, if you constantly have to use the mouse to do controls, you will be a lot slower. Now in Blender, yeah, keyboard shortcuts are important, but there are only 3 million of them. Um, wait, what day is it? Uh, 3.5 million. But they are very powerful. So, say what? Oh yeah, yeah, the, the uh, space mouse. Yeah, those are, those are kind of cool, too. Um, and obviously, if you're doing painting work, you're going to want a graphics tablet, which I haven't plugged that in because we'll see if that uh, is an issue here. So let's make sure I haven't missed anything here. Uh, opacity size. Oh, yeah, it even has mirror modes, which don't seem to do much. Let's get a better color here. And let's pick now. There's several funky tools, and this one is the multi-brush tool. Um, again, I don't claim any artistic talent, but you can see the potential for the tool if there was somebody else running it. You know? um, and of course, like anything else, Control-Z will let you undo things without too much. Huh? Um, probably. I haven't looked at all the plugins or filters for this. Um, but yeah. So, and so you can adjust these mirror modes to a certain extent by some of the tools up there. Apparently that's so important, it's a tool that's put up by default across the top. I think it's fun to play with, but I don't use it too much. Okay. So. Again, you may notice up here, there is, if you just right click, you can automatically put up the Docker menu and add in additional things. It even has the ability to do animation. I have not played with that yet. Um, that's a still slightly buggy version, but it's not too bad. Um, and the basic tools, nothing too exciting here. The Shape manipulation tool, we'll be using that a few times. Text is somewhat limited, though part of their Kickstarter from last year, one of the things that they wanted to do if they got enough money was to try and really improve text. And that's one of the few areas, like in GIMP, I tell my students, pretty well GIMP can do just about whatever you need from Photoshop, except text stinks. Sorry, it just does. It doesn't do adjustment layers. Some people get very attached to those, I understand. Selection tools, those are pretty good. And same thing here, it's, they're working on text. Um, they've got you know, basic brush tools. They have several vector-based tools. And that, again, is not unusual, except you can also have, in addition to paint layers, you can have dedicated vector layers, which are only vector drawings. You can't paint on them or anything else. So they could be continuously uh, updated. The basic selection tools, um, transform tools, and some of the, the different shape tools. Some of the shapes are kind of cool. I mean, if I pick on, we'll say, the circle shape, you know, um, and again, it'll base, be based on your brush setting when you create the shape. If I were to put this on a vector-based layer, though, I could continue to edit it after the fact. So it's got a few kind of Inkscape-like features in it. Um, yeah, nothing too exciting there. Again, brushes, a huge number of them. Um, I just showed you the multi-brush tool, which allows you to do that basically mirror effect. And you can set, set it up so it mirrors in more than one area. Tons of options for editing brushes and their settings. But the part that gets to be really kind of cool is a feature they've got called the pop-up palette. I actually had to look it up. I kept calling it the HUD, because to me it looked like a heads-up display. So if I right-click anywhere on here, up comes a little 
painter's palette. They call it the pop-up palette. It shows you your present colors, foreground, background, the colors that you've already used. So you can see I've got green and white. Inside there, we have the triangle and the color circle for selecting colors. We have a set of um, tools, brushes, if you will, and there's a couple little menus. So if I pick, if I click on this here, so for Eraser Soft, which is apparently the eraser I have picked right now, or the first one in here, it's got some of the settings for it. In addition, it has some palette groups here. So if I were to go to, say, erasers, well, there's the erasers. So it's got several different pop-up palettes. You've got the basic demo, which you, know, you have here, uh, the basic wet soft, uh, basic wet, basic tip, uh, basic mix, and I think they've even got uh, eraser circle and hairy bristles. Um, like anything else, it does have a few keyboard shortcuts. If I use, let's set up a different color here. So I'm going to pick in the red area and about that. So right now the larger color, that red is the foreground color, what you're going to paint with. Green is going to be the background color or fill, which you may use depending on how you're doing cuts or selections. And if I want to toggle between them, just hit X and it switches between them. And if I want to set them back to uh, black, white, just hit D. But the cool thing is, is that it remembers the colors that you've drawn. I think it only does about the last five or six, but it keeps the exact colors that you've drawn with handy. Okay. Well, say that you go through and you're looking through and it just doesn't quite have the setups you want. Close. Come on. Let's close that out. And I'd like to add some stuff to it or make it a, a custom one. Now, I kind of thought it would just simply be a case of, you know, you right click on one of these or you drag it over. Not quite that easy, but not that horribly hard. This can be a very handy tool. So we're going over the brush options. This is where you set this up. So you'll notice you've got your brush presets, and you've got this little tag button over here. And if you take a look, they have a filter that, oh, wait a minute. The groupings are the exact same name as the groupings for the pop-up palette. And there's one called plug. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick a few here. Let's see what we got. Uh, airbrush eraser. So I'm going to right click on that. Assign to tag plug. Um, let's see. Let's get another eraser. Circle eraser. Presently it's got the tags demo. But I'm going to also assign to tag plug. So now when I go over it, you should see plug and demo. And I don't know, I'll just pick another one down here. What do we got? Uh, quick circle, huge. Right click on it, assign to tag, plug. Now, let's go over to our drawing area again. Come on, quit hiding. Oh, well, I'll just right click here. So now we're here. We're going to go and click and choose the plug tag. And now here is my airbrush eraser, my eraser circle, my ink ball pen, and the quick circle huge. Uh, by the way, this one I added previously, so that's why that's there. I had named it uh, with the plug tag. So I can now make a custom palette of tools and save them. And whenever I need to switch, just right click or hit the equivalent button on your uh, graphics tablet pen and pop it up. Choose it and make the settings you want, pop back, and not have to really get 
out of your, your drawing mode. Um, I really do like the pop-up palette. It's a really handy feature if you're using a lot of different brushes, which from some of the folks I've seen, they switch between stuff a lot. Questions or comments on that? Is the number of circles around a pop-up pilot? Fixed, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. But again, you could very quickly switch between different palettes, too. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so you could make plug one, plug two, plug three. You could easily configure this to fit your workflow. And for the folks who are professional artists, which I'm not, um, this type of thing, anything that can help speed them up and get them back into the flow of drawing seems to help. Them. Yeah, warm colors of uh, yeah. green. Uh, yeah, warm. Yeah. If you're using a tablet, like a Wacom tablet, you could, that, that's. Um, in fact, I could try to plug that in. I'm always leery during live demos to try something I haven't tried yet, but I do have a, a Wacom tablet, and when I've used it uh, previously on the slightly older versions of Krita, there's the equivalent of the right-click button on the thing itself. Just right-click, it pops up, tap what you want. I mean, it's, it's really fun. You don't have to let go of the pen. Yeah, these kind of things are, are really good work workflow for people who are yeah. working. And this has been around for quite a while. I'm actually seeing commercial programs starting to um, mimic this. You know, it, it's always fun when you see the commercial folks copying the open source folks instead of just the other way around, because people seem to think that's the case. I especially love some said, oh, this is great. It's like, yeah, that was done in open source first. No, it wasn't. OK. Um, still not quite sure why the, maybe it's just a brush I've got. Let's pick something else here. Mm, well, you can always just go. There we go, and just cheat. Um, lots of different brushes, and a lot of them have strength modes, the speed at which you go, the angle. A lot of them have, you can't see it so well on the projector, but you're actually going all the way from kind of a faded gray to black. And on the projector, it looks like, well, black. Oh, well can't help with that. But yeah, the pop-up palette is really handy. Um, I think it's probably one of the features that I enjoy the most about this. Maybe I'll even take the time to learn how to really draw. Probably not. I've got too many projects. <laughs> okay. Filters. It does have filters, but some of the, my favorites, at least I haven't found them yet. That doesn't mean they're not there. As a diver, one of my favorites is the levels adjustment because no matter what you do, you almost always have lost some of your proper white balance. I, I, folks remember I did a, a quick demo on a picture where it looked blue. There was a fish in it, but it, it basically looked blue. You pulled it into GIMP, did colors, levels, auto, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, that's a bright red and white lionfish. You know, basically advertising do not touch. Yeah, yep. Um, and so it does have filters, and they have a fair number. I mean, it still has some of them. So if you notice, it does have levels. Um, it has a lot of the same ones, some artistic ones. And what's available depends upon what type of layer you've got. Um, so, you know, it's got a decent selection of filters, just about like any program. Nothing too exciting there. Now, layers is where it gets a little bit different. It has several different types of layers. Um, and you don't necessarily have to use some of these layers. Like, if I want to load in a file and just work on it, you can effectively load the file in, and it'll get pasted into the paint layer, and it won't be a separate file. Uh, but you can actually create a file layer, and when you do, it automatically asks you to go find the file you want to load into that layer. So they actually have a specific layer for a file that you want to put in. Or you can just paste it in and make it a, a true layer. Paint layer is the main one that you're going to be working with. Um, vector layer has some interesting uses. So a couple of things I want to do I'm not sure it can do yet. 
Group layers are very important, and do, I'll show you a couple of demos of this because they behave a little bit differently than they do in just about any program I've dealt with. When you put images into a layer, they are automatically treated as a unit, as an image. So if you're trying to do like a clipping mask, and I'll show you an example of that where you want one image to basically crop the edge of another image, you have to put them into a group because otherwise it's, it's going to get confused. So you actually group the images that you want to interact, or the layers that you want to interact with each other. And as far as Krita is concerned, according to the folks who wrote it, that is treated as an individual composited image. So all the work inside that group is done first, and then it interacts with the other groups. Kind of an interesting concept, something I hadn't dealt with before. Um, so let's go to layers. Now the, if you go to layers, You've got, by default, usually two layers. And it's really hard to see the icon. Um, right by that little arrow is a little dotted icon that's supposed to look like a painter palette with a brush. So that's a paint layer. And by default, it usually creates two paint layers. Um, it creates a white background. And by default, any layer you create above it, unless you tell it otherwise, has a transparent background. Um, it's really big on layers, like any good graphics program. And the biggest mistake you're going to make is being afraid to add layers. Uh, of course, there is the ability to overdo it. I did see one beautiful drawing of a subway station that somebody did in Photoshop. Now, true, they would probably collapse the layers at a certain point. But their best estimates were by the, by the time they were done, they had created over 15,000 layers to create it. And I'm going, yeah, back then machines didn't support that much RAM. So you really had to have collapsed a lot of those layers and then created new ones and collapsed them. And whew, I mean, it was an amazing painting, but ouch. So you've got the layer menu down here at the bottom of the Layers tab. So if I click on the Layers button there next to the Brush Presets and Tool Options, you see I can create a paint layer, a group layer, a clone layer, which haven't played with that yet. I'm assuming that just duplicates a layer. Uh, a vector layer, uh, a filter layer, a fill layer, a file layer. And you could also do a transparency mask and a few other things. So I'm going to go through paint, group, vector, files kind of, eh, uh, transparency mask, and a couple of others here. I don't want to take too long. Um, so let's create a new vector layer. And the icon is slightly different. Um, of course, the nice thing is, is you know, it, you, you can kind of figure it out. This is the one part where when you highlight over it, I kind of wish the information would tell me, OK, well, it's visible. It's not locked. It's 100% it's uh, opaque, composite normal mode, inherit alpha no. Do you think maybe vector layer would be a nice little feature for folks? Because I don't know about you, but unless I've got the cheaters on, I'm going, oh, yeah, OK, that looks like four dots held together by lines. That's obviously a vector layer. So I'm going to use a vector tool. Let's do a simple one here. Um, I need a different brush, though. Yeesh. Let's get something a little bit more straightforward. I don't want the tilt. I'm still learning where some of these are. There we go. So put in a circle, and by default, it takes the color of whatever our foreground color is. No problem. So if I click on the Select tool, hey, unlike normally, it now allows me to continue to adjust it. OK, no problem. So oh, I'd like to fill it. So I'm going to go to Fill. And let's pick, oh, let's horrible pink color. There we go. And you go to fill. Does not work. And usually they will pop up a little warning that's saying you cannot use fill on a vector layer. Huh. OK. Well, but can I do that otherwise? So let's go back to, uh, let's create another paint layer and do almost the same thing. So I'm going to be on a paint layer. 
I'm going to pick the same tool. I'm going to put that in. Okay, looks good. Now when I go to move it, hmm, oh, kind of different. If I go to uh, the fill tool, So, I can now paint on it, but if you use a vector-based tool on a paint layer, as soon as you're done, it's no longer a vector, it's bitmapped. So if you want to behave so you can continue to edit it, you have to put it on a vector layer. Now you can, once you get everything the way you want to, you can convert it to a bitmap layer and so on, um, but it can be kind of cool. And, I've got to admit, I did not quite expect that particular interaction, but that's kind of cool. Um, there's a lot of other options that you can use as well. And the other thing that's quite handy is if you right click on a layer, there's a whole menu that pops up. You can, of course, go to layer style, which we will in a minute here. Uh, you can color code layers. You can delete layers, of course. The, the X, by the way, just means turn the color off of the layer. You can cut a layer, copy a layer, paste a layer. Um, you can group a bunch of layers together, though you can do that after the fact. But layer style is pretty impressive. And this is one thing where I kind of wish the GIMP folks would get their act together. Because if anybody's ever dealt with uh, Photoshop, this is that FX button. It's got blending options, drop shadow, intro, sh uh, and also drop shadows, intro shadows, uh, bevel and emboss, contour, texture, all those neat things you used to be able to do for text. Um, it's all here. And it's just a simple right click layer styles. Um, this is something that I would say is something that GIMP needs to work on. Of course, I don't know about their legal team Everything I've heard about 210 is probably about the time that Adobe may start to sue them. I don't know. Not that they're actually copying anything, but I don't think they're going to be thrilled. Because um, a lot of the complaints about GIMP, well, it doesn't have adjustment layers. It doesn't do this. Everybody knows why CMYK support in GIMP is uh, not really there. There's a particular company that owns the patent on CMYK. Anybody want to guess the name of the company? Adobe. Go figure. Um, and we can have the whole intellectual property uh, argument later. Okay. Questions so far? I mean, again, I'm just showing you some of the features. Um, there is, from the folks themselves, they actually have a training DVD, um, and there's a few other resources here. I didn't really get a chance. Uh, Gimmick actually does work for the most part in GIMP as well, uh, but Gimmick is also a plugin that comes with um, Krita by default. And the feature that I wanted to deal with, because I'm working on a, a project here, and I just haven't had the time to really work through it, is they have a coloring tool for folks who do line art. Now, anybody remember one of the big problems with trying to use like a paint fill tool on line art? You go and you want to fill this little area. You go to fill it, and what happens to your screen? It's now whatever color you chose. Because if it's, it's got to be an entirely enclosed area, right? Well, with gimmick, it has a tool in there where it creates another layer and another tool set. You can give it rough regions and you don't have to have enclosed areas. And it's, it kind of uses overlay and a few other little tricks as well to do that effect. And that's what those two links are. Um, the guy did a wonderful job of demonstrating it. He, he apologizes for his French accent, but you know, he does a, a great job of explaining it. I just simply haven't worked it way through. But there are some amazing tools if you are doing this type of thing. Because that's one of the biggest complaints folks have had. It's like, well, I'd love to be able to fill areas and then just adjust them. But if I do that, my line art has to be closed everywhere. And that doesn't always look good, right? 
Um, so clipping masks are kind of an interesting effect. And let's see if I can do one from scratch here. And I'm just going to create a new little layer here. And I am going to create a group layer. And I'm going to rename it. Uh, if you just double click on it, you can rename it. My group. And this is where I do need the glasses. Okay. And I'm going to put uh, two paint layers in there. So I'm going to create another paint layer. And they're both in there. So I am going to create an object. And this is a paint layer. So even though I'm using the vector tool, it's going to turn it into a bitmap here. And I'll even fill it in. Uh, let's try and fill it in. Do, 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 do. What do I want to color it? As my students know, I usually can pick colors that should never go near each other. OK, but that's actually not too bad. OK, now, if I go and paint on this layer, and I'll pick a, another color that probably shouldn't go together. And let's pick a paint tool here and, right? So I've just got a layer on top of the layer. But say that I wanted that squiggle to be bound by the layer below it. This is called a clipping mask. Well, again, the tool is really hard to see on the screen, but there's a little alpha button here. So if I click strike out the alpha, it automatically now clips it to that layer below. But this would not work <laughs> if I didn't have it grouped, because it would clip it to the bottommost layer, which is the white layer, and you get a white screen. So you have to group things. Personally, I've always told my Photoshop students, and yes, I'm trying to get a GIMP class, but um, that don't be afraid of layer groups. They're your friend. In Krita, you really don't have a lot of choice if you want things to work right. You need to start organizing and grouping your images. Now, notice it's made no change to the actual thing. If I highlight, uh, you know, I, if I just simply turn this off, it's still there. It's just being clipped to the image below it. Obviously, you know, because it's transparent, it's just hitting to the end. If it was on a white background, well, it basically wouldn't clip at all. Let's turn that back on. Questions? I got one more little thing I want to show. Now, in the future, I may do a specific topic. But I, from what I understand, they want a kind of a general intro to what some of the features of Krita. Um, the other one that's kind of handy is, and let's just create a um, new one here is the equivalent of what they call a layer mask. So I'm going to create a new one. And I'm just going to put some stuff on here, because why not? Now again, it has a vector base tool here. And if you do shift click, you end, end it there. But because it's on a paint layer, it's now bitmapped. If I try to click here, I can't select it and edit it that way, though you can still transform it, but just not the, the same way as you had. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's basically now bitmapped instead of vector-based. And I'll just fill it with the same color, so why not? Now, what you can do is a variety of things. I can just simply add a transparency mask to that layer. And what a transparency mask or layer mask is, is it starts out white. Wherever it's white in that little square underneath there, everything shows through. If I paint in black, and I can also do it with a gradient, that starts to hide it. So let's see if I can do a simple gradient here. So first off, um, Let's change my colors 
back to the default black white. And now let's choose this layer here. And let's go, uh, okay. Let's see. And nope. Oh, it just converted into a transparency mask. I don't know if you see what happened here. Um, apparently, I basically painted black except for that area. This was the other thing I wanted to do. You could take an existing object and make it as a mask or a hole for what's above it. So I now have made a perfect mask that only masks what I'm showing, i.e., I've just done you know a couple of polar bears in a snowstorm fighting over vanilla ice cream. Um, Oh, now you could also paint on the mask and you should have that selected and it can look like you're erasing the object, but you're not. All you're doing is if I disable the, the mask is that you're hiding it. And this is a very common tool in just about any graphics program. It's a layer mask where you can, based on how you're painting, like if I adjust the opacity, let's reduce the opacity of my tool, and let's increase the size a little bit. Oops, wrong one. Let's increase the size. And oh, make the layer visible again. And I can just kind of start fading out parts of it. And I can fade some of it more than others, and so on. So there's some neat effects that you can do with this. Um, let me see if I can find one of the examples here. I think it was in the summer camps. Now I didn't do. I did this in GIMP. I didn't do this in Krita, but it should work just fine. Um, nope. Didn't do it under GIMP. Um, you know, that's a good question. I haven't actually tried it yet. What I was looking for is, um, and it's definitely something I want to find out, but I had a great little one that I did. Well, maybe it's in the Photoshop class because I showed it to them. Uh, da -da -da -da. There's a ferret one I did where it basically uses, oh, here we go. Now this is where it's been converted. So you have a ferret jumping out of one photo into another. Now the jumping out looks pretty good. The jumping in I still need to work. The actual image is just a ferret on a background like that on the right hand side for the whole thing. I just create a series of layers and masks. I didn't actually erase anything because I occasionally had to remove stuff, move stuff around and then I had to readjust the mask. Which is why it's sometimes better to mask things than to actually erase them. And the idea here is I create a little white frame, tilted it with the transform tool and skew, um, and then put a gradient in the back, then put in another image, put another little white frame, tilted it, used a mask so uh, anything that wasn't uh, inside that little open square didn't show up on that layer. And this is called out of bounds. This was my first attempt. I did it live in class in about 20 minutes. It could have been worse. Um, could have been better too. But there are some really cool ones. If you get a really nice photo, you can make it look like there's a, you know, a photo on a desk and the frog is popping out of it. When in reality, you've just done some very careful masking and adjusting. Um, notice I even put in a little bit of a, sh tried to put a little bit of a shadow under him as he jumped across. Again, it's 20 minutes live. I, I think I did okay. Um, uh, I believe I've got some of them. I know I've got the layers. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Ah, let's see. I believe. Here we go. Oh, actually, it did give me the option for Krita, so I'll have to try that in a second. Okay, so let's just hide some of these things here. 
Now it looks like that's just him, right? Now if I disable, uh, disable layer mask, there's the original image. So I've got a layer mask right over here that if I re-enable it, uh, show layer mask, whoop, and then I've got to get back over here. Could you have done another layer mask for the shadow? What did I just do to the ferret? Apply layer mask. Oh, not show. Show just simply switching between programs. They've all named things slightly differently. Um, but yeah, it's just basically, if you look at this, it's just a series of various masked layers I've got going on. Layer masks are really handy. Did you have to trace the ferret to get the mask? Uh, yes. You basically zoom in and you paint with either black or white. And if you make a mistake, you just erase. Because remember, you're not editing the image. You're creating a mask. And almost all these terms go back to the old photography days, where if you want an area that wasn't going to be recorded, you would literally create a black mask with a cutout for the holes for what you wanted to show through. So if you just wanted to put a person in, you would create a very careful mask and expose it. They use this back in the late 1800s in video. There's a great one. If you ever see the magician, he basically put a glass painted black um, so in about four or five different little areas so that he could appear to take his head off and put it in those little squares. He would have to rewind the film without re-exposing it and carefully change what part on the glass was painted black, expose it again, you know, and do this five times. I is it a little choppy? Yeah. Is it, you know, late 1800s and still kind of, at the time it was an amazing effect. So a lot of these terms, masking and so on, dodge, burn, they all come from the old film days. There, a little bit of trivia I didn't necessarily need to know. Other questions? Were you saying that this doesn't work as well with 1604? For whatever reason, um, there were some major changes to the QT libraries, apparently between 1604 and 1610 and later. Um, and of course, the next long-term release will be April of 2018, if they keep up with things, yeah. Um, so, in fact, if you look on the boards, a couple of the bugs that are in 3.14 or whatever version of 3 you're using, um, they're blaming it mostly on changes to QT. So it's apparently causing issues with that. You can still get a fairly decent version of Krita for 16.04. It's just if you want the bleeding edge one, you're going to have to probably use Snap or upgrade to 16.10 or later. Yeah. And Snap. When I finally tracked down the removable media thing, there's still some folks who are kind of, for these types of programs, they're going to have to figure out something a little bit better because that's ridiculous. There's no way you're going to have folks going, snap interface, snap connect, Krita, colon, removable dash media, and then not have it work and have to do in a, a symbolic link. If, you're, if your goal is to make it transparent for your average user, yeah, no, Snap's got some issues. Could have been worse, but, you know. And of course, you've got flat pack. Is it app? App image. App image. So you've got three competing standards. And of course, when you use a number bigger than one, the word standards, standard doesn't really apply. Yeah. You know, did you say, did this originally come from France? I believe it was. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I, one of the demos is by somebody who's in France. But I'm trying to remember, I got the hint from looking at their page that it was a different country that was trying to support it. And I thought it was France, but I'm not entirely sure. Oh, actually, we could try one last thing, I guess. Let's see if you can indeed open up this. Open with Krita. 
And if smoke comes out of my machine, well, oh, and it's going back to 2.9.7. Um, oh, hey. It does indeed open it up, and uh, it seems to have all the different little mass and so on. So. Do you have an older version on your machine? Yes. Got to remember, snap little things are in their own little planet, uh, which unfortunately is difficult when you want them to work with the rest of the laptop, like removal of media. So I can install the snap version, and unless I explicitly start it, it's going to go to the default one that comes with the machine, which is 297, which isn't bad. I mean, it's a good program and a, uh, version. I just foolishly thought, well, let me show them the most recent version and decided to do that, you know, last night. As is typical of a Linux user, why do it the easy and safe way? Yeah, yeah. Questions or comments? How long this, this app has been around? Good question. 12 years. 12 years? OK, I knew it was over a decade. You, you mentioned that they were trying to get funding to do some things. That was in two, 2016, so they're already applying some of it. From what I looked on the Kickstarter page, they got a fair amount. Um, but yeah, they're supposedly going to be making some improvements to it. I, I didn't double check to see if they got the stuff for the text, which would be nice, um, because this is one of the areas where GIMP does kind of fall down. The text editing in GIMP is, it exists. Everything else I love, but that's one of the areas where, yeah, okay, Photoshop's got to beat hands down. So. Thank you very much. Okay.